I believe I have already forwarded to you a list of questions. So I am going to ask questions out of those lists only. And anyone who has written answer to that question can start answering them. I'm going to ask you the questions. You can start answering those questions. Wait, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, I would be highlighting the row in red. You can start asking that question. Okay. So, uh, uh, what I got was like, uh, I kind of like, uh, So the success of any project is also like for us time. So it's important to have the right people and they will help us to do the success. So uh, basically in this business scenario I'm assuming is that uh, we are putting a team from scratch from for the project. So the uh if we can solve the appropriate budget uh, uh, uh it's considered as like the second Many operations and technology teams like this are not possible. So, when a project arises, there are six phases. This is it. Uh, some, um, in this instance, mostly they lack certain things which are needed to be used. Mm -hmm. So, we do a, uh, we are able to work with many companies and many tasks that can, uh, like, we can uh, do it in the middle of the year. So, where they are lacking, and the what skills they don't have, and uh, we can also uh, find out like what are the requirements they have. So we can find source through which the skills can be trained to the right people. Mm -hmm. So what skills can be done? Like, uh, what skills have done? Like we have identified all the key results from the soft skills and the technical skills which are needed for the project. And uh, uh, one more technique I want to mention is like they have a they have a number of uh, that they are setting a range from 1 to 10. Mm -hmm. So the minimum level of competence needed for each skill. Uh, so it, sometimes when we use like 5 or 1 skill, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we are going to rate each uh, team member according to the skill. Um, so we are going to find out more, uh, like most uh, closer team was meeting the required threshold for a particular skill. So this is the problem area that requires attention. So we are going to find resources in order to uh, improvise. Problem domain is basically the uh, area which we are in the uh, Problem domain is usually identified and understood with the skill level. Mm -hmm. Sky is the size and scope of the pro uh, problem domain area. Uh, it can uh, uh, greatly differ from the goals of the project that are being taken. Mm -hmm. So the scope may align with the boundaries of the entire organization or it may be with the smaller or grander organization which is still organization in the uh, specific Even when the scope of the problem domain, the problem domain aligns with the boundaries of the organization, we need to use the sometimes people from outside of the process of organization. So, so they will be like the for example, customers, suppliers, or any other stakeholders um, to provide an input uh, or accept an output of the process of organization. Mm -hmm. So, in simple words, to say the problem domain is anything and everything that is needed to improve in any area under 
Mm-hmm. We understand the inputs and outputs of the software. We understand the inputs and outputs of the software. My research, I found that uh, in yes, actually, uh, there are few considerations that drive the way requirements are defined in order to do the acquisition of commercial software systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, why we uh, believe that the uh, most requirement for commercial product should be defined in terms of uh, the software what we build. So the requirements should not be to then have a business, but rather to understand the capabilities of that product. Or does it have to compare different products in order to build uh, it? They should be documented as to this requirement, that requirement, this requirement, chemical grade, chemical grade, and chemical grade. Mm-hmm. So once the solution is chosen, there are no, de- uh, there are no detailed requirements can be found. So there is no particular product need to be configured or configured. Uh, another side, uh, This is totally most important. Why is chemical grade? So, uh, first we will define what is the output of production. The total cost of production is the total amount of work that the machine can do. So, in completion, that considers the total cost of acquisition which is going to be done. Uh, let's assume this is going to be in 5 to 10 years. Mm-hmm. Because the cheap cheaper solution is going to be the acquired, which is not a So some factors we need to think through is the calculating of the cost. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they will be uh, the software solution to either purchase or level up. So hardware, purchase or repair leasing, as well as ongoing maintenance. Mm-hmm. Some system tools and utilities as well as the cost. Uh, personal cost is not the personal cost like business and technical uh, or involved in acquisition. Uh, as well as estimated personal operate and maintenance. Mm-hmm. Will increase the technology to not to bring them like the technical support or to uh, acquire new stuff with that customization to be, be fact, also be factored into the cheaper cost. Mm-hmm. These maintenance costs are estimated to be around, uh, for example, uh, uh, lifetime period, like under the one to year period of production. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it may be all the system tools should be required to do the you know, personal effort to effort to upgrade and maintain, but that's not actually the Tasks that are automated, the amount of operation support required, or even the amount of participating changes or errors that are done in order to make the system work. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so that should be, you know, that's why you are thinking this way. Okay.
which I kind of like uh, researched was uh, we, I don't have any practical experience in this, but but there are some techniques like uh, mm -hmm. some few tips or some, uh, to make the effective investigation. Like the few tips are like first of all, uh, like start with the mm -hmm. make sure the Like what you want and let them be something clear for you at the beginning of the campaign or the campaign. The workshop is like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, to do this, we are going to write all the notes down. We are going to talk to the group for everyone. So everyone will be one track. And uh, if there will be any uh, like confusion or noise or something like that. Uh, the second thing would be like create a As the spirit, people to keep to reach at the top and uh, keeping it uh, more uh, positive, it helps to create more of like negative feelings. And also, we get more ideas from the partners. Mm -hmm. And uh, third will be like we can engage all the partners, engage all the partners, uh, or like ask everyone to get involved and actively engage with the partners. And uh, there is a lot to focus on. Uh, uh, like very couple of uh, like few participants or uh, we should not let them dominate the discussion. Uh, so uh, by that, uh, if they start dominating, so let them go to the next place to discuss the parties. So it's good to engage all the parties. Okay. And the fourth thing would be keep the group together. Okay. Uh, for example, if someone is distracted or not paying attention, they can call me their name and ask me their name. Okay. Uh, so when we call the name, if they tend to maybe for time limits. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's, uh, we, uh, it's easy to do start on time giving and then like, we keep uh, actively moving and create a, uh, like a sense of urgency at the start of the week. Like, like, how much time they have to come and collect. And mm -hmm. we should monitor the progress along with time limits. Okay. So giving time limits is like a good thing for us. Okay. And one more tip would be uh, like divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we determine the ideal group size for discussion. Mm -hmm. Usually it's between three to four because it gives everyone the opportunity to immediately comment. Okay. If the audience is larger, uh, look for opportunities to break up into smaller groups to act in the areas of interest or to make sure that mm -hmm. which area is better. Like with the movement or the okay. uh, few more tips are like we can we should prioritize the ideas. Uh, if there are any dead debates in any group, then that I kind of uh, we should make make sure that the discussion cycles are normally tied to like uh, different areas of interest or uh, different uh, subjects which make very good like for the discussion. Mm -hmm. Secondly, like uh, making the group more structurally focused and uh, mm -hmm. can help the group and make itself more audible in the discussion. Uh, I think these should uh, help. <coughs> For this one, uh, when the when we analyze the problem and the problem, we need a number of questions. We need to update our thinking and setting up the uh, main points, the business points to act upon. Mm -hmm. So at this stage, uh, there's uh, one thing uh, to get the equivalent of the thing that we do. That is the uh, analyst needs to get high level understanding the uh, problem point. Understand any object of who, what, where, how, and why. Mm -hmm. So, through these questions, we can actually uh, analyze the report calibration. 
So business of PA, how would you ensure application usability? Usability is a, uh, basically, uh, let's define what is usability. It's basically the measure of the interactive user experience within the system, um, like a business system or a website or mobile application. And then focus on the fields of, uh, uh, basically we're applying here uh, human part psychology and uh, human computer interaction fields of study. 
um, it's the quality of the system that makes it useful in achieving a user's goal effective and easy to quick to learn and likable. Um, that will be uh, subjectively pleasing to people. So in this few things which we haven't discussed, usefulness. So uh, we're going to define how useful it is. Describe the extent to which the system enables the users to achieve their goals. The end goal of the user can be achieved. And there are no missing uh, critical features. So all of the requirements are met, at least on the most basic level, even if the user scores aren't achieved with optimal efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to remember the goal completion. And second will be effectiveness. Describe the extent to which the system is easy to use, which is typically measured mm -hmm. um, quantitatively in terms of how quickly a user can achieve their specific goals, as well as doing it without encountering major obstacles or system errors. I like uh, so this will be uh, like a goal path optimization. Okay. And third will be learnable. Describe the user's ability to achieve a defined level of efficiency within a predetermined amount of time. Mm -hmm. A learnable system may also be described as an intuitive system taking very little time to master. So in this we need to remember all the like the paradigms and best practices. Mm -hmm. And the fourth will be likable. Uh, we should describe the user's uh, perceptions and opinions about the system overall. Mm -hmm. um, so basically in this we need to uh, remember this is like an emotional response. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, how it's implemented, this can be, uh, usability can be uh, done uh, usually uh, during testing sessions where we can invite users and give a series of tasks to complete. Uh, and uh, they are, they should not be given any assistance uh, from the facilitators, but as the user, user attempts to complete their task, the facilitator mainly they document the behavior of the user, including all the emotional reactions, points of confusion, user performance, and how efficiently they are doing it. And few more things, uh, and uh, an analysis of this resulting test data can be used to make the uh, design changes and perfect the usability of the application. Okay, fair enough. Okay, good work. Um, who wants to come next now? Thank you. Sir. Uh, I can go. I have done almost all the easy entry level questions because that's what I'm been applying the job for. Okay. Hmm. That's... What problem does agile user stories and epic solve? So, an epic is a large body of work that can be uh, broken down into a number of smaller stories. Mm -hmm. uh, an agile epic is a body, like a body of work that can be broken. <coughs> down into specific tasks called user stories mm -hmm. based on the uh, like needs and requests of the customers and end users mm -hmm. and so epics are uh, helpful uh, in a way to organize your work and create a hierarchy mm -hmm. and it is ideal to break work down into uh, smaller pieces so that large projects can actually uh, get done and we can continue to uh, like deploy the or ship the value to their customers on a regular basis mm -hmm. and also epic help uh, to, to break their work down while continuing the work towards the bigger uh, goal or objective mm -hmm. user stories are uh, user stories are also an important component of agile software development mm -hmm. and user stories put the actual end users at the center of the conversation mm -hmm. stories if the user stories use Technical language to provide context for the development team and the network. Mm -hmm. User stories are one of the core components of the agile project. So they help provide a user centered framework for the daily work, which drives collaboration and a better product overall. Oh, so great. the main purpose of the user story is to articulate uh, how a piece of work will deliver. Value back to the customer. Perfect. 
this particular life cycle of the universe. Okay, so use basically user stories are used to capture the functionality or a feature that a system or software so should provide. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, like the, at the beginning of the project itself, we write uh, user stories are identified and developed in a story writing or brainstorming session. We write epics and then convert them into features and user stories while working them on. Uh, the team comes up with as many user stories as possible in the user story document itself, and each story is sized and prioritized like for how the project should work. Mm -hmm. The prioritized list creates uh, the product yeah. backlog, and we put all the user stories in product backlog. And during the uh, uh, project, the uh, team will select an iteration length, like a sprint cycle, and also uh, how much user stories can be completed in its spr in sprint cycle. So both of which become determined determining how to schedule the user stories. During the whole planning iteration process, the user stories contained in the product backlog are segmented into iterations or sprints. The user stories for the sprint, first sprint make up the sprint backlog. Okay. Once the first iteration is ready to kick off, the conversations begin for each user story between members of the team. Mm -hmm. And the user stories get updated with details on the conversation captured in the form of acceptance criteria that we write for the each user story. Mm -hmm. So user stories can be updated at any point uh, according to the needs and if there is some ambiguous details about user stories, we can update it and make it clear for the development team. Mm -hmm. And if the user story remains incomplete during the iteration, we put it back into the product backlog or ship it to the, the next cycle. Okay. Great. Uh, there, like the few things that I found through uh, net and all, like how can you increase as value as your business uh, as an analyst can be. First thing is you should always be driven and interested in constantly increasing your knowledge and skills base it's as good like it's always good to know more things on your part and have developed more skills in the field you are working mm -hmm. and you also can participate in different groups or networking groups or some learning process where you can meet people or an online community where you become an active member and you can keep up up with the latest points in the mm -hmm. analysis domain or business analysis domain. You can write articles or you can do blog entries, discuss issues with related to business analysis topics. This will showcase your skills and knowledge also. Mm -hmm. The best way to learn is by teaching also. You can teach to your colleagues or your junior members and listen from them. You get queries and that's one mm -hmm. of the ways you can improve your knowledge uh, by solving their queries and stuff. You can always read books like Pybook and many other books that are available for uh, business analysis and you can uh, increase your knowledge. Okay. And always you can also take courses and do certifications where you, you are uh, propose different challenges or different situational uh, conditions where you will learn and adapt to it. So 
Miss use case is actually derived from a use case itself. Mm -hmm. It's basically a requirements and process modeling term used to describe the steps and the scenarios which a user performs in order to complete or accomplish some take malicious act against the system or a business process. Mm -hmm. There are still use cases in a sense that they define the steps that a user performs to achieve a goal, even if the goal isn't in a positive one or desired one from the perspective of business process or the design mm -hmm. because uh misuse cases type of use case all of the information that you might already know about use cases apply but creating a misuse case places an early emphasis on security features that business processes and system mm -hmm. should consider okay. consider a case where an analysis planning the registration experience for mobile application Mm -hmm. Then, for convenience, analysts may not want to require a new user to have to check the email and click a verification link to provide the email mm -hmm. that belongs to them before accessing the application. But there is a important use case to document it and consider that in the case where other another user attempts to register using an email address that belongs to someone else, mm -hmm. then in this case we might use case actor way anyone. Then there may be options for the designing around this problem which may lead to a uh, misuse case. Okay. So uh, there is uh, not a specific document that class diagram only belongs to, according to me and some of the uh, articles I read. It's basically like it depends on in what context you are using the class diagram. So class diagram can also be used as a domain diagram to explain the main things in the domain and their uh, attributes like uh, can depict the main things that other domain users want and then its relationship among the things. Then this class diagram would represent a domain model and mm -hmm. would probably belong into the business requirement document. But on the other hand, if you go for the coding part of the uh, project, then if the classes and their attributes are defined and it shows one to many relationship or cardinality between those classes or database tables, then mm -hmm. it will part. It will be a functional document, and so it might. Uh, it will be a part of a system specification or a specification requirement document. Mm -hmm. So I'll now we'll like to start like mean what is the purpose of this feasibility assessment to document. So as we all know, like feasibility assessment means how feasible the project we are going to undertake is. But we can also look at it from the scale, how big is the project, how wide is it its applications and all the stuffs into consideration while taking a feasibility assessment. So there like I like I found the three major questions to be asked while uh, gathering a uh, requirement for feasibility assessment. And I would say like, does the solution offer sufficient value or benefit to outweigh the estimated cost and risk? So like, we should always check if it's uh, the value or the profits that we are getting from the project are outweighing the amount we are putting or the risk we are taking. That is the, one of the first questions that should be asked for feasibility assessment. The second question that might that can be asked is the does the organization have sufficient capacity and resources to require implement mm -hmm. and support the proposed solution or direction. So at any project you take you will always have to get the list of the people and the capacity and the resources that you have as a part of a company. Uh, whether you have that many human resources or the uh, sufficient amount of people to work on that project for a dedicated time. 
and to get the project done. And also, how well will the solution fit into organization business, technical and information environment? Like, uh, we always need to check whether the solution that we are proposing uh, does fit with the organization's business because there's always some ongoing business that is running in the organization. If you are trying to improve that business through a new project, then we need to check what what it is and is it mm -hmm. uh, uh, profitable enough or worth enough to change the old process and start a new uh, update or uh, bring in a new aspect of that uh, business, both in technical way and in business. Uh, okay, that question is done by Karan. He was also doing the open interview. Okay. Yeah, Karan, please go on. Yeah, so actually, I've not done this question. I don't think I've said for this. Okay, anyone else who has prepared this question or can make some answers out of the context? I have just I've collected information on this, but I don't know whether it's a perfect answer or not. Yeah, please go on, whatever information you have. Okay, so it, understanding the users is a, a core principle in the user centered design. Mm -hmm. so, 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 utilizing user personas as a design tool can help you accomplish it. And user personas like are fictitious but realistic representations of the uh, of your target users, so they act as a multi-purpose tool used to drive many important product development tasks, such as the creation of user scenarios and uh, prioritization of uh, created user data. So, personas take on a format that is meaningful, creates uh, user empathy among your development team, and also. The users, which are always the focus. Mm -hmm. So the, the persona creation process involves user research and data collection, uh, turning data into personas, uh, uh, creating personas with limited time and resources, and, uh, okay. Okay, uh, so uh, there is a very uh, uh, beautiful course available in Coursera, which would, uh, you know, uh, appropriately justify the answer to this question. The course name is Prototyping and Designing by University of Minnesota. So that course is really good and it would help you explain what is a demographic segment and how we classify the persona basis on the demographics. So it would uh, give you some insights on how this prototypings are done and how this user-centered design are being carried out. So when we say user-centered design, it's not only about designing by segmenting the people based on their age group. There are certain other fa uh, factors as well, like which area do they belong and what are the necessary implications these uh, particular regions have uh, on the designing of the uh, system basis on the person for example if you consider a, a person who belongs to a senior age group in United States it's not the same as the person who belongs to a senior age group in India 
in india people tend to you know uh, you know struggle a lot when they are in that particular age group while if you consider the same age group people in uh, in united states they are more smart in terms of uh, accessing the system so if you consider a senior person who may be your grandfather or grandmother in india they may not be able to you know withdraw uh, or operate an atm uh, i mean uh, amount from an atm machine but if you consider the same user group in a different region like uk or us they are much more uh, tech savvy people and they should be able to do the same activity in that particular uh, context so it's not about uh, you know uh, uh, considering only the age group but we have to also consider the geographies in which this age group of people reside so this is just one example there are many other examples as well so when you say designing a particular user interface or wireframe it is not particular to a piece of software there are other areas in which you would be designing the wireframes or prototype for example you can design a, a wireframe or a prototype um, for a uh, activity tracker or you can design a wireframe or prototype for a, uh, what i would say an ipod or any sort of physical device which may not have a visual user interaction but it would be having interaction in terms of voice commands or in terms of any specific commands but there are certain patterns that are being studied uh, in conjunction with the law of geography around for example if you consider <clears throat> people from one particular state then the people from the adjoining state would be having the same behavior so this is how the uh, interaction or the user centricity of the personas expands itself so if you could go through that particular course it would give you more uh, sense around what i am trying to explain you so it is like um, you know uh, it's a long discussion um, in terms of answering this question so you can go through that particular course i believe that course is available for free if you could subscribe for a one month trial account in coursera you can go through that particular course Okay. Sure. Uh, which question did you have? Twenty one. Okay, so uh, how does the business analyst role change on an agile project compared to the project using others? Okay, so uh, mostly the role of PA should actually change not much, uh, but very little in the context of different software development methods are used. But basically, the tools and the techniques that we use uh, will be varying according to the needs and the attributes of a given project mm -hmm. or the SDLC. So, the requirements or responsibilities of the on a project would include requirement illustration, requirement analysis, and management, regardless of whatever the methodology is being used. But the type and format of requirement documentation uh, may vary according to the methodology. So, uh, like elicitation, effective elicitation requirement, elicitation from stakeholder is one of the key parts of a BA role on any software project, is just, and the BA is responsible for ensuring that requirements are clearly articulated, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he should resolve any inconsistencies or uh, ambiguities that is uh, there in the project and find one unified solution. An agile project may utilize specific tools and techniques like for collecting and documenting requirements 
but the elicitation role still exists. Like this is one of the ways we can tell that uh, the way a BA works in different methodologies is a little different, but the main core part uh, in the role and responsibility of BA is same. Just with the methodologies, it's the, how the each phase is carried out and which tools are incorporated in it. Phase. Okay. Okay, let us quickly start with Mohit. Is he there? Uh, so, Neil, so I've uh, done questions like uh, most of the questions highlighted in yellow. Okay, these are the questions that we have already discussed last in the last session. Okay. Okay, you didn't prepare anything from this list. So actually, we divided all the questions uh, to do to cover all the hundred questions. Okay. So some of the questions that I did was the question. Okay. So let us start with those questions. Uh, so for this question, uh, I've not actually encountered such a, a situation, mm -hmm. but if maybe I do in future, I would reach out to the relevant stakeholder to discuss his or her concern by asking him or her regarding the view of this project, uh, which will allow me to better evaluate the project from his or her perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, this way, I'll be able to understand the stakeholder's perspective of the project and understand his or her concern. Uh, having said that, I do not believe that any of the stakeholder would intentionally want to sabotage the project and uh, would be uh, and uh, and being responsible for the execution of project, uh, I would take all the necessary actions to ensure the successful. Uh, pro I would to ensure a successful project by involving all the relevant stakeholders and any additional senior members if required. Okay. Great. Uh, so while I was working for a project with American Express, uh, the process involved regulatory check of the existing client base uh, to avoid any anti money laundering or terrorist financing activities using the American Express channel. Uh, to facilitate this, our project was to implement an automated system that runs the existing American Express client database against a derogatory watch list. Mm -hmm. uh, during brainstorming sessions and my sessions with SMEs, I, re I realized that certain hits that are being generated for American Express clients who were uh, individuals were against certain uh, pirate sea vessels which consumed unnecessary time for of the American Express FTEs, that's full-time equivalents for review. Uh, I suggested the uh, management to build in an automated feature within the new system that will automatically uh, suggest the American Express FTEs uh, the nature of the alert that will save the time and hence the number of FTEs required to process the job. The management was excited about my proposal and the system was built, uh, taking my advice into implementation. Uh, this one, I guess, Karen, you have done this question? Yes, yes. So, like, uh, when I was working for my uh, current project at uh, Quick and Moon, mm -hmm. uh, I had, like, two uh, junior analysts working with me on the same project. Mm -hmm. And uh, they basically did not have much experience working with the tablet tool. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had uh, requested my uh, the manager to allocate uh, some, some of the time during the day uh, for them to uh, understand the tool and get more experience using it. Mm -hmm. So, so like, uh, 
Uh, so basically, a facilitator. Uh, I'm sorry. What is this? Is the last ninety sixth question? The yes. Ninety sixth row. Yes. So, So, I have a elicitation technique uh, uh, in almost all of the previous projects. So, uh, talking about the recent projects uh, in Quicken Loans regarding the loan approval system, uh, I have conducted a brainstorming session to make the process better and understand different areas uh, from the uh, different interview teams in the organization. And I've also led the gap analysis sessions to understand the as is and to be process. And uh, also, uh, uh, I've conducted the chat sessions to elicit the business requirements and user requirements from stakeholders. Okay. And uh, also uh, understood the functional and non functional requirements and uh, drafted them so okay. that uh, uh, the internal teams could have a better understanding of their product. The loan approval system is going to be. Uh, develop for the uh, in-house team. Okay, fair. Okay, it seems that uh, you are well prepared for today's session, and uh, I want these sort of preparation to be consistent towards your last interview as well. Um, so you can ask me questions on this particular forum section if you have directly. Just log in into your particular account and select your respective question category. Once you select that respective question category, you can directly ask me question on this website. If not, I have already shared my email ID with you. You can directly mail me on that particular email address. If you have any questions that you might uh, need help with that you might have encountered in a particular interview. So that is it. Do you have any questions for me since it is the last session and we are meeting for the last time in this particular batch? So it's just one thing. So I was not able to figure out like uh, with how can I like relate uh, how can we actually relate feasibility analysis with an existing project. So if you can just share like how we did feasibility analysis in an existing project. Like for example, most of the project like at least what I have mm -hmm. it's regarding uh, building a portal an online portal mm -hmm. or uh, creating a portal which is like uh, it's nothing that has never been done before. Uh, so how can I like check the feasibility of something? That already exists and how feasibility analysis and is it like always required um it's not always required so uh, to answer uh, this question i would first uh, say that it's not always required uh feasibility study helps us understand the risk associated with a particular project so it's not like that we always typecast our thinking 
in terms of understanding the risk from an implementation perspective so what you are thinking is from an implementation perspective so feasibility analysis technique is never um, used standalone only to think from a perspective of implementation however you do, it is majorly used for assessing the risk associated with a particular project like if this thing doesn't happen then what would happen and if you consider a fit gap analysis then uh, you would be um, you know more inclined towards the, uh, the implementation part wherein you would mark whether this particular thing is fit for the project or gap for the project so when it comes to implementation your technique is fit gap analysis and when it comes to identifying the risk associated with a particular project the technique is feasibility study okay sunil yes got it okay so uh, not the questions from this list i would be uploading some youtube videos on this particular youtube channel i did uploaded two three videos you can go through those videos those are essentially scripted videos but it would give you up to the point answers on how to answer the questions i have already uploaded two three videos you can go through that youtube channel so per week i would be uploading four five interview specific questions you can go through it and it would essentially help you better prepare for your interview it won't be any entry level question as such rather it would be situational question that i would be solving in that particular uh, series of videos and for anything else you have my email address you can reach out to me anytime and uh, if not via email i already explained you go to the forum section you can put the question over there and i would respond to you uh, yeah that the question that i had faced in uh, so uh, i uh, the interview which i gave uh, with, uh, uh, like that uh, where i was uh, sorry karan uh, your voice uh, was uh, uh, breaking was, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I had faced a, like, uh, in my interview that uh, he asked questions with people and then he went to data warehousing and uh, ETL process. Mm -hmm. So in that, uh, uh, he asked regarding uh, whether I had, uh, like, I explained to him the concept behind the back table, dimension table, and uh, how does the ETL come. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was asking me regarding, uh, like, how, like, whether you had created a enterprise data warehouse My first question is, uh, was it a business analyst interview? Because uh, looking at the question, I don't feel it was yeah. relevant to the uh, BA. So, yeah. so it was not uh, position for uh, data analyst. Okay. So for data analyst, they are specialized in terms of uh, doing database operation. So if you are working as a data analyst, it is expected that you have some knowledge of implementation. And to answer your question, whether you created a data warehouse from scratch, so in that context i would say in today's scenario not even the startup organization creates data warehouse from scratch they are already created they are just using those data warehouse and creating whatever information or creating channels for whatever information they would like to consume from that particular data warehouse because building a data warehouse is a huge activity no I don't think any organization would be creating data warehouse from scratch at this point of time. Okay. okay. I believe everyone has registered for that exam portal. Uh -oh. Yes, probably. Okay. Okay, then you can take your exam as per your convenience. Those exams would never expire. You can take it at any point of time when you feel you are ready. Okay. 